Greetings and salutations to our fine podcast audience. My name is Jason. My name is Ed. And I'm Nathan. <laughs> See, I started a new thing. <laughs> I know, you have. I didn't know we were continuing that. I love throwing y'all curveballs. For curve people balls. that oh, yeah. were with us last week, he did that last week for the first time. Episode 94, and we're switching it up. And I'm j- I just he couldn't like wait till 100 to make it make sense. I like to throw curveballs. Right. Well, here's the other curveball. This is a day early. We are a day early. If you Yay. are If you are watching, listening to this, and you're like, I thought this thing happened on Wednesdays. Or if you're like most people with podcasts, you're like, I, I, listen, I don't care. I listen at the same time whenever I, I get around to it. Whenever I get around to it. <laughs> but yes, this podcast dropped on a Tuesday. Uh, and there's a reason for that mm-hmm. because we have more stuff coming. There's going to be something else to come into your feed because we know you're asking for it. Of course. Yeah. They're always asking for it. So, Nathan, you are the man to ex- describe to us what is new and exciting about this week. Uh, yeah, so we have a second podcast that is coming out. Uh, are Jason and I in it? No. Okay, we're not in it. It's going to be the greatest. <laughs> we, cut you, we, cut you, we cut you out. We cut you out. It's, it's going to eventually replace this podcast. <laughs> Uh, nice. I just uh, started starting the the coup d'état right now. So um, no, we are actually starting a um, podcast that's really um, in conjunction with our family ministry here at Community Christian, um, and it's going to be called the Family Movie Night Podcast. And really, the heart behind it is that. Um, really core to what we do here uh, in our family ministry, children's ministry, middle and high school ministries, um, are really not just designed around teaching your kids things about Jesus, but about helping you as the parent to disciple your children, to help them love Jesus and his way of life more than anything else. And we know that key to that is your relationship with your children and the amount of influence you have with your children. And so we know key to that, uh, all key metrics towards a child's uh, psychological, emotional, spiritual development is the kind of stability and connection they have in a family unit right. and and with their parents in particular. And so things like um, family meals around tables, I mean, over and over again, all the studies point to a key mm-hmm. metric to the health of families and children are how often they have regular meals around mm-hmm. tables. Yep. Things like family game nights and obviously family movie nights. And if you're a parent uh, in Community Christian, you know we have these family game nights that happen all the time where we're trying to encourage you guys to do that. We send resources home so that when you're having meals around the table with your family, you can talk about what they're learning. And we want to just try and help you because we know being a parent can be busy. It can be stressful, and most of the time you just feel guilty for what you're not doing. Right, yes. And we don't want to make you feel more guilty for what you're not doing. We want to help you do something that you want to do. And in our world where everyone has their own individual screens, we know a shared movie night experience as a family could be a great thing where you all put your own devices away, mm. we watch the same thing together, and we can talk about it. And not just to have fun, but to be able to have meaningful conversations because movies are a great way, stories are a great way to talk yes. about issues that can be emotional, can be sensitive, uh, can just be personal to them in a safe space where this is not real life mm. and you can engage with it. And so what we're doing is this movie podcast, and you'll hear more about it, we're going to be taking basically different movie recommendations that we'll suggest to you because we're encouraging every family to have one movie night a month. Okay. And then we're going to try and give you recommendations so you don't have to sort through content. But then we're also going to try and give you handles of things to talk about while you watch it. Awesome. And so now, is there going to be one particular movie per podcast, or is it sometimes? Uh, so I know that the the first one, because this the episode that's releasing this Thursday is really an introductory. You'll get to know uh, the host of the podcast, and um, kind but of, it's not me and Jason. It's not you and Jason. Thank no. goodness. No, uh, I will tell you for those of you who do the online live stream, and, and you are we're used to seeing uh, Donnie Dorsey on our virtual lobbies, and you've been missing seeing him. You got to come to the 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 yeah. family movie night podcast he's gonna be a regular part of that all right um so Love yeah some donnie but sometimes yeah. one movie sometimes a lot of movies we're starting with holiday movies everybody loves christmas movies oh so boy. we'll be having a lot of fun classic christmas movies or new stuff a little a little bit of everything we got oh, i'll tell you the first movie yeah. is home alone so okay oh, well, that's which my funny. kids were insanely excited about it's probably their favorite movie of all and time. the second one will be die hard yeah that's right <laughs> that's right so there you go 
There's that whole debate on it whether it's a Christmas I movie. Know. You know. Oh, so. it's a Christmas movie. Okay, good. And I see what side you fall on. There you go. Okay. There you go. All right, so you guys uh, who are in our podcast feeds, and and is it going to be on YouTube as well? It'll be on YouTube. And same yeah. channel. Yeah. Same channel. So just if you're subscribed, you're going to get it. In two days, you're going to get that in your podcast feed. And yes. you can listen to it or you can delete it. You can just, or, yeah, just buzz on it. past it. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. But we think it'll be helpful to you, especially if you're a parent. So, all right. Thanks or for doing that. Or if you just don't know about movies and you want to. Hey, if yeah, you're just, you just a movie lover, movie. Yeah, 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 it'll be great. So, all right. Or you're just a a a, a fan of Donnie. Well, that if you works just too. like Donnie and you want to hear Donnie talk about super stuff, fan, super fan of Donnie. Yeah. You just want to see. I'm a big fan of Donnie. So okay, I I'm too. very I excited. Love Donnie. I'm a too, I'm a man. big fan of Donnie. Who does? So. All right, we got three things to do today. Two questions. And then we've got something special at the end of the podcast. So we're going to make the questions. These are kind of rapid fire questions. These Lightning are, round. Bam. Kind of. They're not, they shouldn't take They're long. not doozies. They're snoozies. <laughs> I don't have another word. I wouldn't call it that. <laughs> okay. I would just say I think we're going to be able to. They're, pretty, <laughs> they're just pretty quick answers. I All think, right. For most okay, of these. get to it. We've made so, fun of them enough. That's right. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, they were sent in by listeners. And uh, by the way, I haven't said this in a few episodes, but if you want to send a question to us, there's a link in the description, podcast feed, and on YouTube. Click it. Send us a question. You can do it anonymously. You can tell us who you are. We will answer it on the podcast. First question Can you recommend a good book on spiritual warfare? No. <laughs> no. There you go. <laughs> Quick answer. We all of all three of us when we talked about this, we all said that we have not found one that we just thought was really Yeah, good. I found I've read some before that I go, "Oh, that's an interesting point. That's an but that I would just recommend as, "Hey, take this and this will give you everything you I need have, to know." I have a book and you all mentioned it. I'm not going to mention it because it is not entry level reading. No. And I made that mistake about 15 years ago, giving it to a friend of yours mm. uh, to read, and uh, that didn't go well. It's it's a great book. It helped me figure some stuff out. But do I know a good one that would I'd recommend? No, mm. no. That I, one's about 800 pages. I mean, I think honestly, <laughs> then it's not a good book, <laughs> not for most people. I don't know what you're looking for out of it, but. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean this as a sarcastic answer, but the Apostle Paul writes a lot about spiritual warfare in the Bible. And, I mean, I think, I don't know what you're looking for, but the I Well, to say he writes about it, he alludes to it. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's what I mean is everything that we apparently need to know about it, he's already written. I, I do think that's true. And so I think um, from the nature of... Uh, that that our enemies are not flesh and blood. It's not our job to be against human beings, but that there are other forces at work, and that primarily the way the way that we defeat them is through prayer and self sacrificial love. And if you are if you are praying, if you are engaging with God in that w- way, and you are you are focused on loving other people in a cross like Christ like way, I th- I think you're I think you're in the right I, direction. I had one of my mentors, counselors, friend, what he was all of those, say to me years ago, people are never the problem. People have problems. Mm-hmm. People are not That's the great. problem, Ed. People have problems. Yes. That really, when I finally let that sink all the way in, people are to be loved, and they have problems. Mm-hmm. They are not the problem. Mm. Well, all right. So, uh, sorry, we couldn't help much more than that, but we really... Ask the question a different way, maybe, and we'll have a yeah, book. Maybe yeah. if you want, but spiritual Do war... Do you have a book you want to recommend to us <laughs> if you say, want to do that? Maybe. Most of the stuff that I read around uh, spiritual warfare, I said to them when they asked me, I said, yeah. they it doesn't fit with the rest of biblical theology. Yeah. It comes off... It has it, a little bit of a uh, sci-fi feel. It, to it has to sci-fi <laughs> either to it or witchcraft yeah. a little bit. Oh, yeah, it yeah. feels not Christian to me. Like, for instance, I remember back when I was coming up, there was a, a series of fictional books written about spiritual warfare Frank Peretti, by are you Frank talking? Peretti. Yeah. And I remember they were all the rage and people loved them. But then once people who were biblical scholars started getting into them, they were kind of like, eh, well, maybe and not. Frank Peretti himself wanted people to remember they were fiction. Exactly. They were not intended to be blow by blow how we're doing spiritual warfare, but yes. people built. Theology around off of them, which is dangerous. So, yeah. so yeah. anyway, just know what you're go. doing. So to not turn these into too long of answers. Yes. So there you go. All right. Second question: Can you explain what the rapture is? 
And then the second follow-up to that question is, if the book of Revelation is written to help Christians at that time of their persecution 2,000 years ago, when and why did Revelation become such an apocalyptic book that so many preachers and Christians use in the modern world? I think what they're trying to get at is that this, this theology that has been built around um, really what, if, if you've been in the Christian subculture for a while, the Left Behind series of books. And you, we really should be clear in the uh, a certain branch of Christianity, mm-hmm. not even the dominant branch, mm-hmm. uh, it's Protestant, evangelical. Yes. Not even all Protestants no. believe this. Mm-hmm. Certainly, this isn't taught predominantly in Catholic uh, mm-hmm. theology. True. So the it's not ether, it's not Orthodox uh, theology, and it hasn't been. Well, the, the rise of it really is less than 200 years old. Well, I was going to say, let's get that out of the way. The, the doctrine you're speaking of, this idea of the rapture, which, which most people, when they say that word, they mean that there's coming a time when Jesus is going to return, but it's going to be kind of a secret return, and all of a sudden Christians are going to disappear off the earth, and then all the other people are going to be left here to fend for themselves for a period of time. That teaching is so new. In the overall scope, in the, uh, scope I mean, of to us, it seems like it's the whole thing. Yeah. But that's like saying, you know, the United States is an old country. It's not. It's Mm-mm. a baby mm-hmm. uh, country in the history of the world. Yes. And this theology is younger than that as a dominant force. There have been people in history, I remember from es- studying eschatology in the little bit I did in school, that there were people in ancient times that believed this, but Beginning around Augustine, almost everybody in the church world believed that the millennial had started at the time of Jesus. Hmm. That uh, From Augustine on, yeah. that's when it really began. There were people before that that took these words and took it to mean something, but almost nobody really believed that. And then around, I think there's a guy named Darby, around the end of the American Civil War, that mm-hmm. began uh, to have this rise of premillennialist, Oh, it's really dispensationalism is what mm-hmm. led birth to this whole thing so that God has dispens- different dispensations and mm-hmm. the rapture will be the end of this kind of thing and then there will, the kingdom will literally come to the earth and yeah. all those kind of things. But it really, and it led to all kinds of things. Jehovah's Witness started during that time as a branch off of that. True. Uh, the whole thing, Christian science started off of that. It it all has It's led to a whole bunch of kind of things of this thing of, you know, thinking about the dispensation, dispensationalism. So I don't want to say too much about it. A lot of this you can find answers to if you really want to know. It won't take much Googling for you to figure out when did premillennial, <laughs> which is what the rapture, mm-hmm. I mean, the word rapture, everybody knows, isn't used in the scripture. Nope. Uh, so if you want to know when that began, it won't be hard to find when the rise of that. So then, you know, Darby, and then there's Schofield, who wrote a, he wrote a study Bible that became the dominant study Bible of the early 20th century. And then a guy who taught at Dallas Theological Seminary named Charles Ryrie, mm-hmm. he, he sort of developed that up and it became a dominant thing in most Southern Baptist circles, which have been the dominant force in the South where yes. Or we are. Yes. yes. So that kind of answers your question of how that teaching has built its way into common or I shouldn't say common because it's not common to everybody, but no. in certain circles of American Protestant Christianity yeah, these days. Yeah, certainly the churches so. I grew up with. I mean, I went to some churches when I was a little boy and it always felt like scarce stuff to me. In fact, Donna, who's been with me since the start of this church, is a staff member. She was the first person I hired, administrator around here. She and I would joke about there was this song called I Wish We'd All Been Ready and not the D.C. Talk one. No, it's I the mean, old, the, early, the original. The early 70s one. Larry Norman. And there was a whole movie around that, that there was a point where you sing that song, people literally getting snatched up, and they'd show it at every youth night, and we all had to get ready because the rapture was coming. And, mm-hmm. you know, then there was the late great planet Earth that was written, and that yeah. was going to happen when that happened. And then, and then we got the Left Behind series in the early 2000s, and... Is it, interestingly enough, you grew up in a church like that. I grew up in a church that was 100% against that. Sure. So, but we would both have said we came from pretty much the same exactly. branch of Christianity, but there was even a disagreement within yeah. those two. We had the so. charts on the wall with the dispensations so of the we, history. Mm-hmm. We had all of that stuff. And there'd be dragons in these. And, I, and as a little boy, I was like, oh, my gosh. Yes. 
So that's a short answer to a probably much more nuanced question, but that that does kind of get you where I think you were asking for. Yeah, where did it rise up? You yeah. can certainly find it. It's yeah. it's mid nineteenth century. Definitely. And if you want to know more about that, I mean, we can, there's not much more we can say about it. Right. <laughs> no, I don't, not we without, are we are not well versed in it because no, we, we, we don't not, believe we it. don't. I say it's yeah, not we what we believe it. in. We, so I've not done a ton of research other than that. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to get too snarky about it. That's no, I don't either. I don't want to be. Truth. I don't want to be because uh, people who do, I'm not saying they're no, not Christian. No, I don't. I don't either. No. Yeah, it's just not us. It's not us. No, it's not us. Yeah, I think I think if you listen to enough of these podcasts, you know how we see. God's activity in the world and what's hap- what what He is working towards and what will come about at the uh, coming of Jesus. I'll right. just leave it at that. Yep. All right. So, all right. Um, last thing we're going to do today. It's going to take us to the to the end of today's episode. Uh, is a follow up from what you heard us talk about on Sunday. So on Sunday we did uh, a little bit in our services, both online and in person, about some local ministries that we are supporting to help do good and bring God's kingdom into the world right here in our little corner of it, right here in Coweta County and the surrounding yeah. areas. And so today, uh, as a bonus to what you guys saw and heard on Sunday, we're going to show you a little bit of an extended interview from one of those partners. So, uh, Ed, I guess you'd be the one to set yeah, this I'm one Yeah, I'm okay. You know, in this series we're in on Sunday, it's called Upstream. We're talking about we want to work upstream with problems that are in the world. So we started talking about working upstream with in the money that we've been blessed with and how we invest that for the kingdom of God. Oh, there's a guy and his wife in our church, uh, Hank and Shelley Arnold, who started a ministry a few years ago in our county called Coweta Force. And uh, it's an acronym, which anybody knows me knows. And Hank, I'm on their board, so I should know this. I am a board member at Coweta Force. I do not remember what force stands for. <laughs> but it's about recovery. And we're sorry, Hank. <laughs> I know. Man, we're sorry. I am not. Friends of Recovery and something, Community Empowerment or something that like that. That sounds exactly yeah, right. I think that's what it Every is. single, and Hank knows this, and so when he watches this, he'll know it. At every board meeting, they have more acronyms they talk about and I at every one I go I don't know what that means ah. if I'm supposed so anyway this, it's about recovery it's about helping yes. people in recovery uh it is done I mean it is such an amazing yes. ministry yes, in our is. community that uh we're thankful we get to partner with them and uh the partnership they have with us is amazing listen to this you're going to enjoy it very much all right. Well, uh, everybody, I am here right now in a Google Meet uh, with a member of our church, a friend of mine, but also the founder and director of a great organization that Community Christian uh, supports right here in Coweta uh, County. His name is uh, Hank Arnold. He's the founder and director of Coweta Force. Hank, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely, man. So uh, real briefly, I'll tell you right up front uh, from the beginning when we were uh, we just yesterday recorded the kind of intro that we're going to put on our podcast for this. And Ed, uh, who is uh, on your board at Coweta Force, uh, told us that uh, Coweta Force is an acronym. Force is an acronym, but it may shock you or not shock you. He could not remember what the acronym was. So can you, before we even get to it, tell us what does force, I'll tell you this. I took a guess and I'll tell you afterwards how close I was at the guess. So tell me what does force stand for? So we get a lot of people that think one, that we may be affiliated with law enforcement okay, and other people that think we may be a softball team. <laughs> So those are the two extremes that we get. But FORCE is that acronym, and it stands for Friends of Recovery for Community Empowerment. I was really close. I didn't okay. have four community empowerment, but I, I figured it was Friends of Recovery, and then I said com- Community Empowerment. I thought I had seen that somewhere, so I was oh, pretty yeah. close. I was pretty close, but Ed could not remember. As as you know, you know him well. Acronyms don't work well in his brain. So. Right, right, right. Anyway, okay. Well, for people who don't know, tell us um, just big picture overview. What is Coweta Force? 
So Coweta Force, we exist to provide addiction recovery support services in our community for family members and individuals that have been impacted by addiction. It's basically what we do. Um, and we really want to be a resource and an organization that fills in gaps in our system, in our services, providing linkage to additional support services in our community and just be a, a service that fills in the gaps because there's a lot of gaps in our system around substance use and or mental illness. So give me an idea of when you say there are gaps, you know, you don't have to get too specific, but give me an idea. What gaps are y'all filling in? So let's just throw out this hypothetical. Um, you have a family member or you are a person in the community that needs services and support around addiction and or mental illness. Um, the first thing that you're up against is combating the shame and the stigma. Um, so we want to shatter that stigma and just make it OK for people to come forward and at least explore and start having these conversations. Um, and uh, that's a really important piece. I know. That's a big barrier for most people. Um, and I see this topic be a source of uh, embarrassment or shame for family members as well that don't want to say, oh, we're, you know, we're a certain type of family in this community. And we have like this daughter or this sibling that currently is struggling and we don't want for other people to know about it because somehow it looks like we're responsible or that we didn't do our jobs as parents or that we come from a bad family. And uh, part of what we want to do is advocate and educate our community on addiction can happen to anybody. Absolutely anybody. Um, and we see all types of folks from all kinds of socioeconomic backgrounds, all, all sorts of ethnic and racial backgrounds that knows no boundaries. And so that's ultimately uh, some of the things that we're up against personally and as a community, but also from services that we have available in our community. And unfortunately, when it comes to healthcare around this topic, it always comes down to money and insurance. And if you don't have money and you don't have insurance, uh, access to care is pretty limited. And also the quality of care that you're receiving is also very different than if you have the financial backing resources uh, or, or the insurance that that works well with those type of organizations. And so that is a, a big gap and a big barrier, um, especially if you're looking at um, the difference between the public health system and the private health system, two totally different levels of care that you're receiving there. Um, and we also want to let people know that uh, most people think that treatment equals recovery uh, and that you have to go to treatment to be in recovery. And our staff are all people in long-term recovery from substance use. So <clears throat> we want to inform our community members that they can start taking action today and they can begin their recovery journey today, right now. Um, and so those are some of the things that we try to do. Uh, we also provide linkage to additional support services that maybe we don't provide here, like crisis stabilization or detox or treatment or recovery, uh, support of housing, those sort of things that we don't necessarily offer, but we are kind of the hub in our community that has a lot of relationships all over the state that can provide that direct linkage for whatever the needs are. But, um, you know, we also have to have a willing participant. So, uh, where did this idea come from, Hank? I know a little bit about your story, but for people who don't, um, Tell just briefly a little bit about your story and, and, and how um, working in recovery and helping people in recovery led to the creation of Coweta Force. Yeah. So, you know, as an organization, what is in our, you know, what's what's driven our personal development and our personal growth has ultimately been the platform for which we get to show up and be an organization. Um, so I'm also a person in long term recovery and what that means for me is I haven't used alcohol or any other substance uh, in nearly 12 years. And it was a result of my recovery. I've been able to work on sort of the root issues that continued to be patterns in my life that I couldn't necessarily see when I was in the moment. Um, and we also know that for, for me, um, change happens on purpose. Change doesn't happen on accident. So it requires intention. It requires daily effort and energy. And for me, it required a, it, it required a community of people 
the understood that had been there, that had done that and wasn't living that way anymore. Uh, I'm also a returned citizen from the criminal justice system. Um, and when I got into recovery, I had quite the colorful background. I like, I like to use that word colorful because it is. Um, you know, in 2014, I received a full pardon from the governor of all of my prior criminal history. And I received a full restoration of rights, which is, you know, redemption. Um, and uh, it was it was, you know, those things no longer follow me, uh, which is which is pretty awesome. Um, so ultimately, that is sort of the heart of our mission is just to be a resource and a support. Because where do you go get help for something you can't talk about with anyone? Where do you go and get accountability, daily accountability um, for a topic that you're not having a conversation about? You know, the hard conversations. And we 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 believe that it lends credibility to our community because we all have sort of this background and this past that we have been there and we have done that and we have overcome these obstacles in our life through the uh, support of uh, others in our community. So uh, we, we think that that peer support model is really important. In 2013, I went through a training through the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse, and it was really um, tr promoting this peer support model, um, meaning that people that have lived experience in recovery have value. Um, People aren't teaching what we experienced in active addiction in school. And even if they are teaching it, it's just a class. And so our, our past has value. You know, uh, our previous experience has value. It allows us to be empathetic with people in a way that a lot of times, if you haven't had that experience, it's tough to call on a time in your life. If you've not identified with a specific situation, it's tough to, really support somebody through that it doesn't mean that you can't it just means that we have more credibility because of our our past experience so all of our staff with the exception of shelly the deputy director are people in long-term recovery so five of us are in recovery from substance use so I, and i and i can hear it a little bit in in the way you're talking about it hank you talked right from the beginning that this idea of of shame being being one of the, the the biggest enemies against recovery and being able to be in recovery and then you say this this thing and i was writing it down in my notes here of saying that our past has value that that by its nature is is an empowering statement can you talk about that that for someone who comes in and i come in and maybe i'm feeling ashamed how do i work myself to a place and how and i guess the better question is how does Coweta force help me to move from a place of shame to a place of seeing my past has value and I can be a part of society empowering others. Does yeah. that make does that question yeah. make sense? Yeah. So one of the, the parts that we do, we've been really intentional with our space, how it looks, how it feels, how it smells. Um, the furniture that we have here, the color on the walls, we've been very intentional and very detail oriented in how our space feels. Um, and so one of the things that, that we really feel passionate about, and it goes right along with our mission is creating a safe space for people to explore options. Um, and you know, when I'm sitting in my office, knee to knee with somebody that may not know my story or may not know my background or may look and say, oh, he's got on a button up shirt and a pair of khakis and he's the director of this organization. He doesn't understand where I've been or what I've been through. Um, and it's not really a competition on who blew, who blew their life up the most, but I can identify with some experience on, for instance, we're Tuesday mornings. We we're, we're in our County jail four hours a week. And when I'm in that County jail, um, they allow me to bring in my projector and I do a slideshow and education and a presentation. I have before and after pictures. Like I have mug shots over here and then I have like, photos of my family and the life that I have today. Um, and those pictures are very, very telling because, um, because of my past experience. And so part of what that did for me, because I had somebody in my life early on that really did that for me that I would look at and I was sort of judging 
my insides by their outsides mm. and thinking that um, there's no way that this person understood or had lived this previous life um, and are now successful in their recovery and living their life. Um, there's no way they could possibly understand. Um, and so when, when I share some of my story and some of my past, I'm able to uh, just give a little bit of hope, you know, that no matter how far down you've gone, and I believe, I mean, like the more areas of my life that aren't together, the more areas God has to, 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 to work with and to completely turn around. You know, when I got into recovery, I surrendered everything because everything was just, it was horrible. Right. So my surrender process and my, my level of desperation coupled with the surrender that I experienced early in recovery, it became really easy to give it all up because it was all not going well, mm. <laughs> you know? Um, and it's almost like the, the more of a mess my life is, the more work can happen and the more, miraculous turnaround can come about and you know part of uh what we also like to do is connect people to their purpose and to their passion right mm -hmm. and i know that i would say man a large part of our church are people in the recovery community i mean a large part mm -hmm. i would say it um, i would say a, 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 a minimum 30 mm percent -hmm. i would say Mm -hmm. of people that uh, go to our church, go to community Christian or people in the recovery community. And you take that group of people that have had an experience with recovery. And what you have is a group of people that are willing to freely share that information and freely walk alongside somebody and freely just be available for individuals. And the payoff for me is watching it happen in their life, you know, and it doesn't always happen but it never gets old for me. I could, I could watch that all day long mm. uh, because what happens is I get caught up in my day to day and I have responsibilities and I have family. And I woke up this morning at uh, seven 45 and took my kids to school. And this becomes my routine. And it's really easy for me to forget what uh, January, 2010 looked like for me. Right. Mm. And it also keeps it really fresh working with folks walking in the door and when I see the miracle happen in their life, when I see the change happen in their life, it, it, it reminds me of the change that happened in my life and it gets me really excited. So um, connecting people to their purpose and to their passion and letting people know that their stories do have power and uh, helping them understand and, and be able to tell that story with purpose, power and passion to help the next person out. Yeah. So, Hank, try and paint a picture for me. Um, if I'm a person who f figures out I'm, I'm at a place I need help and I'm coming to Coweta Force, what does the experience look like for me when I come to Coweta Force? What is it that you guys are going to do for me? Well, um, the first thing you're going to get is a warm welcome. Mm. Right. So, um we have somebody up front when you walk in the door um, that's going to greet you and that's going to introduce themselves and uh, going to make you feel welcome and comfortable from the very beginning. So that's it's intentional, right? What what we do with folks that are walking through the door is very intentional. And um, a lot of times we're just going to we're, we're going to want to hear what's going on. We're going to want to hear your story. We're going to want to listen to what's going on. And I believe that through that dialogue, you know, we're in the relationships business, right? Uh, how do you have influence in someone's life without a relationship? Um, and um, so we're, we're, we're strategic in, 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 in the relationship and building trust and building in uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the safe place to be vulnerable. And a lot of that comes through a dialogue. Um, through sharing our lived experience and identifying with people with the things that they have going on. And, uh, you know, we have people come in. I mean, they're just in all kinds of different places. Some people are just maybe considering, you know, you'd be surprised at the people that just show up because their wife found us on the Internet. 
or they like our Facebook page and see what we have going on. And they have some things going on and, you know, people are like, Hey, I'm just here because my wife told me I needed to show up. Like, what are you guys about? And so really whatever gets people in the door is fine. Um, so you really never know what you're going to get. Some people come in knowing exactly what they want. And some people come in not knowing what they want at all. Um, and so we really just want to build in and find out one of the questions that we ask and it takes people back is, um, how can we serve you? You know, cause usually in situations around this topic, you're going into places and they're saying, this is exactly how it is. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. And if you're not willing to do those things, you can't, you can't be here. Um, that's not really our, that's not really our, um, our philosophy, right? So um, the only thing that we ask for individuals that are showing up for support and conversations is that they're not putting anybody else in this building at risk. So we ask that you not show up impaired or have any kind of illicit drugs on your person or anything that's going to influence or trigger anybody negatively. But outside of that, you can just show up. We're open nine to five Monday through Friday, no appointment needed. You just show up and have these conversations. So a lot of it is the conversational piece. And um, we try to be intentional to have regular contact with someone. So minimum for someone early in recovery, we try to get buy-in for um, something on a schedule, right? So if we could schedule a one hour individual conversation with someone once a week for the first 30 days, that's fantastic. And we can just figure out number one, what their goals are, what's getting in the way of their goals and also assessing for like what types of recovery capital do you have? So when you think in terms of recovery capital, uh, you think about most people hear capital and they think finances. So you, okay. So if you equate it in, in that sort of a perspective, how much money do you have in the bank account? Meaning how many resources do you have available to you? that are going to support you in this new lifestyle. But because recovery is bigger than not putting a substance in my body. It's also about changing a lot of my daily patterns and my actions. And it's also about my thoughts. And it's also about my perspective and beliefs, right? So all of that stuff is getting challenged. Uh, and that's a lot to sort of take on. And you're not gonna, you're not gonna walk away from one conversation having all that figured out. You know, this is about an experience. And so ultimately we're trying to create a safe place for community members to have an experience uh, that motivates them to continue moving forward. So, Hank, you uh, described uh, Coweta Force as kind of a hub uh, for the recovery community and for people who are trying to um, to step into the recovery community. What are some of the resources that you can help connect people to through Coweta Force? So we aren't associated or necessarily affiliated with anonymous programs. And I know that... Uh, you guys get this because you guys allow anonymous programs to meet at the church. Um, but we provide a space for anonymous programs to meet. Now, not all of our meetings are not or are anonymous programs, but we have 22 support group, group meetings a week at this facility. 22. And some of those are 12 step anonymous programs and some of those are non 12 step programs. So we also believe in multiple pathways to recovery. We don't believe that um, everybody gets well and maintains their recovery the same way. So we want to offer a variety of resources and a variety of support services so that people can just kind of figure out like what's right for them. And a lot of our individual conversations with people is us maybe making recommendations for additional support services that is offered here in this building. So we do that. We also um, we have family support groups. We have a uh, community member uh, forum support groups where community members can show up and ask questions. We uh, have a lot of opportunities for community members to be involved, be it people in recovery or just interested allies. Um, so we have that component, but we also have the component in our county jail where we are establishing a relationship with people in that setting, which means that they're gonna be more likely to come and see us when they're released. So we have a lot of people coming to us from the county jail that are needing housing options, maybe food, maybe clothing. Um, 
those types of services. We also have uh, resume building, budgeting. We also have uh, linkage to employment, career and education opportunities. So all of those like sustainable things, that's the empowerment piece is that, you know, we can walk you through those processes and we have these services available. Uh, and it's kind of formulating a plan that fits the individual's needs and what they're going to be willing to commit to. So those are some of the things. We also have a lot of pro-social events and activities. For instance, on Friday, we did an outdoor movie night that was open to the community. Uh, we watched a kid-friendly movie out in the parking lot on a 14 by 9 foot screen on a projector, those type of things. Uh, a lot of opportunities to, to, to engage with our community with and, and just put a, a positive face and a voice on recovery. Um, and we're really, we're pretty much open to anything. If somebody has an idea and they say, hey, this has helped me in my recovery, I would love to, you know, provide this as a service for Coweta Force, bring it. Those are the other things that we're able to do because we have the ability to, to do whatever works for community. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, so you talked about the, like the movie night. I know you guys have had some like um, other events in the community. How is that part important to what you guys do about um, why do you think it's so important that this stigma around recovery um, gets removed for people? Um, why, why is that such an important aspect of what you do? Well, you know, I hate to bring in statistics, but I'm, I'm going to a little bit. In 1999, we had about 17,000 Americans die, die from overdose or related to alcohol or other drugs. In 2017, we had over 70,000 Americans die from alcohol or other drugs, which is more people than we lost during the Vietnam War. And we consider that a major loss of American lives, right? This past year in 2020, that number skyrocketed to 93,000 Americans that have lost their life to alcohol or other drugs. In Coweta County alone, during COVID, alcohol sales increased 60%. And our overdose rates here in Coweta County have increased upward of 20% in the last 12 months. So there's a sense of urgency, right? There's a sense of urgency around this topic. And I feel like because of the shame and the stigma associated with this, it doesn't have the advocacy in our public health care and our community for people, a lot of people that may have misconceptions around addiction and or recovery is that um, maybe those people just aren't worth it, right? If there's a criminal behavior element in that and there's some reoccurring patterns of behavior associated with that, they're really looking at the characteristics of the symptom of the issue and aren't really able to see what's going on in the heart and the minds of this individual, you know? And so the ability to put a, a positive face and a voice on recovery is also going to leverage partnerships and relationships for people in our community to care about this population. And then to also equip those individuals on, on the knowledge and resources and what they can do to contribute to the solution, because there is a solution. And the more unified we get and the more educated we become as a community on this topic, the more we'll realize that we can do something about it versus sitting back and just sort of pointing the finger at the problem. And, that, and you know as well as I do, that doesn't really change a whole lot of things. Um, and so creating that is important. Also, the pro-social events and activity are very important because I mean, we got to have some, you know, we're social creatures. We have thousands of years built into our DNA on, on connection and community. Whether we're introverted or extroverted or what our personalities are, we are built for community with other people, right? And one of the biggest things that keeps people in recovery, especially early on, from showing up to these social events and activities is maybe they don't know how to have a conversation without having a substance in their body. Maybe they don't even know like what to talk about. That was my experience when I first got into recovery. I didn't even know how to have just a general social conversation. And I was, I presented very awkward and uncomfortable and very reserved because of the fear 
that I had going on because of the anxiety of showing up to a new place. And so we want to create some social environments where people are accepted and are welcome to come in and explore sort of these new options, which is also a part of a new lifestyle. Facing some of those fears, having a familiar face and some safe activities for people to engage in recovery supports in the community is really important. You know, so that's an aspect that, um, you know, for me, I can remember early on uh, and it wasn't in a recovery support group meeting. This was in a safe environment. It was a Friday night and it was a social event. And I remember going to that event and it was a safe place, meaning free from substances with people in recovery. I remember leaving that event and thinking, I got a shot. I just had an amazing experience. I had a lot of fun. I connected with some people. I was able to have some uh, authentic conversations uh, in a social setting. And I can remember leaving that event feeling like I had a shot, you know, and I felt felt a little hopeful about uh, this becoming a lifestyle. And so we want to create that for individuals in our community in a way that is really laid back and relaxed. So tell me some... Um either stories or maybe numbers or ideas of how you guys see Coweta force is making an impact in, in either our community or just recovery communities in general. What are, what are some ideas for people to get an idea of, of, of what's working? Uh, oh man, there's so much work in here. Uh, one of the things that's working is that we ask our community what they want. What, what a, what a, what a concept, you know, <laughs> asking like what's not a, what's not here that, that would would make things easier for you in your recovery. What would support you better? And so ultimately, we've done some focus group with the recovery community, some listening sessions in the community where we have actually actually been intentional to ask those questions. And uh, our whole sort of what we do here is based on what is not available in our community. Um, our average number monthly are is around 1500 people a month that we have contact with and this isn't like oh my life is a dumpster fire always these are we're a great place to maintain long-term recovery and have volunteer opportunity service opportunity um, we are a great place to figure out what's next a lot of folks that volunteer with us uh, we've had several volunteers that we've hired as staff and been able to get trained up. And that's, that's really, that's really awesome. Um, I'll say what's working for Coweta Force is that, uh, you know, it's, we're open to ideas. We're open to concepts. Um, we um, have the ability to do whatever support someone in their recovery. Um, and so what's working for us is our community partnerships. Number one is working for us because we, we, we have our lane. We have the thing that we do really well. Um, but for the things that aren't within our lane, we have enough resources in our community that we have uh, intentionally collaborat collab collaborated with community partners to provide the additional resource and wraparound services and support so that the whole person's getting their needs met versus just like one area. Um, so our ability to show up and ask questions, uh, we show up to every community event that's out there. We'll, we'll have a booth. I mean, we'll, we'll be at the Sharpsburg market. They'll be selling like homemade sweaters and wreaths and jams. And here we are in addiction recovery resource center that is uh, passing out flyers. Uh, we have Narcan available. Uh, Narcan is the overdose reversal medication uh, in the state of Georgia, you can get that medication without a prescription. But if you go to the pharmacy, it's going to cost you between 80 and 120 bucks for a dose of Narcan. And so we partner with Georgia Overdose Prevention and we get Narcan for free. And so we give Narcan for free and we train people on how to administer the medication so that they can preserve life. And usually when somebody's had that type of experience is a really good opportunity for someone like me to have a conversation with somebody about next steps. Um, our ability to, um, to show up and just be that continued resource in our community is what's working for us. Um, we recently purchased a new building, which has been pretty exciting and terrifying all at the same time. Um, we're nearly tripling our square footage. Um, and, uh, we're, 
we're going to have a lot more room and a lot more opportunity to engage the recovery community and have more resources available in our community. So the possibilities are endless. We've been an organization. We had our first meeting, planning meeting for our organization in January 2016 in the business office at, at Community Christian Church with 10 volunteers. Um, and it has grown into something that uh, we never thought would happen, you know. Um, so that's what's happened. This is what's happened since 2016. I can't imagine what another year or two year or three years looks like in our community. The more momentum we get, the more we engage the recovery community, the more that we're able to reduce the shame and the stigma and offer uh, additional resources. And we have a lot of things on the horizon that we want to do. And by we, I mean me. <laughs> Shelly says, don't even talk about doing anything different because as soon as we talk about it and start putting any energy into it, it starts happening. Uh, so we would love to do where we're, we're currently having conversations around supportive housing options for people because we just don't have anything for supportive community recovery housing in our community. So most of the time we're referring people outside of our community, which is really unfortunate. We have a couple of things here in our community is resources, but there, there, there are a lot of unmet need here around that. And I keep kind of waiting around for somebody else to do it. And it's just not happening. So that is our sort of next venture along with the move and the build out and the renovation of our new space is looking at some supportive housing for community members that desperately need that as a resource. Well, Hank, I think uh, everyone at Community Christian who's who's listened at least this far into the interview, I mean, it's, it's probably just so excited and so proud of what you guys are doing. Uh, and we are very just proud to get to have uh, partnered with you guys and helped you guys in this journey. Um, as you said, I mean, just from the very beginning, uh, Community Christian has been working uh, with Coweta Force uh, to make this a possibility. And every dollar that's given to Community Christian, part of that goes to support what happens at Coweta Force. And, you know, part of this interview is uh, was designed really to help people who uh, are giving to Community Christian see how what they do to give to God and his kingdom, where it's being worked out in our community. And so, uh, Hank, if you could say something, uh, if you could say something to people who um, people who give at Community Christian, what would you say to them about how what they are doing is making a difference at, at Coweta Force? So, like I said, we st we started in 2016 with a conversation. Over that first year, into 2017, we had a whopping 270 dollars in our bank account. 270 bucks. Right. We were doing this work before we had the funding and it was sort of a side project that we had full time jobs and we had organized volunteers and that sort of stuff. But what finances do for our organization it is gives us consistency. It gives us the ability to be a consistent resource in our community, that the doors are open, that the lights are on, that we have people that are meeting uh, people in the recovery community with intention consistently in our community. And, you know, it's for us, everything has always been provided. We'll take a step, reevaluate. We'll take a step, reevaluate. And, um, you know, we are a nonprofit, but we still have to keep the lights on. And because we're not charging people for services, right, it's available for everybody in our community, but we are dependent on uh, the contributions of, of our community partners. And so, you know, it always comes on time, right? It always comes on time. We have like this financial uh, barrier or something that we're up against. And then uh, we recently got a check in the mail from Community Christian last month. And it was like the morning we were talking in our staff meeting about some sort of like barrier we had. I go to the mailbox and I pull out an envelope from Community Christian. I open it up and it's a check that meets that need, right? And so we're, we're just continuing to show up, walk in our faith. Uh, we try to be, um, we, are, we are extremely responsible around finances because we know that that sustainability piece is, is gonna directly impact 
our ability to show up and be consistent. So I just want to thank, um, thank the church, thank, thank my home church for their contributions and for supporting our organization that's doing some great work in this community. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Hank, for all you and uh, your team at Coweta Force are doing. Uh, and also just for doing this interview and taking the time to, to talk to us about it. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And um, I look forward to seeing how this interview turns out. Uh, it's always cringy for me to like see myself um, <laughs> doing an interview. But um, I'm always grateful to talk about something that's really uh, in my heart and that I'm really passionate about. So thank you for the opportunity to share our message and thank you for the support.